thank you very much, uh, Mark and Mark. Um, it's easy, actually. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things I have done with my small research team uh, about uh, the data that has been, uh, let's say, publicly available on COVID-19. And what we actually tried to do in the beginning is we started to do predictions um, and to see if there is change, uh, changes are going on in the spread. And one of the other things we have tried to do is to um, uh, discuss uh, what are the governmental interventions doing to these particular spread of the virus. Uh, so this is uh, more or less my uh, presentation um, with the content. I would like to start a little bit with uh, epidemiological research very quickly. Most of you probably know, but it is good to set the stage. And then I will talk about uh, for host growth models. Um, I start with the most simple one first give you a little bit of background and show you what I've done with the predictions and how we uh, looked at uh, generalizations. And then in the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the influence of governmental interventions. So let's first talk about epidemiological research. Eh? It all started in China with this COVID-19. Um, I think that the first patient uh, was, uh, well, um, let's say detected or known to be at uh, December 12th, uh, at least that's what the WH uh, report uh, tells us. It's probably not the first patient, but it was the first patient where this, uh, um, a lot of research started to, um, a lot of research started to find out what this patient had. Um, this patient had all kinds of complaints um, and they determined that there was some kind of new virus uh, underneath. And from that moment, they also noticed that there might be some kind of contamination going on, and they started to search um, all kinds of people that might have been in contact with this patient and other patients, of course, that uh, turned out to be uh, rapidly growing in uh, China. And what they did is they actually start sampling in a particular way. Um, they use a lot of teams. So they used 1,800 teams of epidemiologists uh, of at least five people to uh, essentially uh, hunt down uh, all the people that might be in contact with the infected people. And what we found there, or what they have uh, reported, is that um, the percentage of infected people is about 1 to 5%. And here in the table, I gave a few examples of um, how many people uh, were, uh, okay, how many contacts they tried to find, uh, how many they actually were able to find and uh, test as well. Uh, and you can see also the number of percentages here on the right hand side uh, of how much uh, were actually contaminated with this new virus. The Chinese uh, always uh, also has uh, what they call beaver clinics where they started to test. And based on those tests, they actually demonstrated that the people who are coming to the fever clinics are not very likely to have uh, COVID-19. That is a little bit of the beginning. So. So what can we do with this data? Um, clearly, this data that they try to collect doesn't satisfy what we would like to have in epidemiological research. It's a kind of a purpose sample. Um, and so they start with the person who is infected. They try to find out with whom they have contact. And if this person has been in contact and also infected, they start looking for other uh, people again. And so it's a kind of a snowball sampling type of approach. And this might not lead to a representative sample of the population. Um, they most likely are the ones who have serious symptoms. So there is a selection going on. And another thing that is not there, certainly in the beginning was a kind of an issue is the sensitivity and specificity of the tests. Uh, I think that the sensitivity of some of the tests they have been using actually has only 70%, 70% sensitivity, which is not a very high number. So based on this, you could actually say, maybe we should stop doing research on this particular data set because it doesn't satisfy all of the uh, requirements we usually like to have on a sample data. Okay, there is of course a kind of a counter argument maybe why we should still continue. First of all, purpose sampling is uh, sometimes better than probability sampling. Uh, case control studies in uh, epidemiology are an example of this. Uh, John Snow, eh, the uh, well-known famous example of uh, cholera outbreak in London, used the purpose sample. It's frequently used in market and opinion research, um, so it seems to be uh, uh, suitable. 
And also probability sampling is not always uh, perfect. We might have lots of non-response and a random sample doesn't mean it's not exactly, doesn't mean it's the same as the original population. So based on this, we would like to continue with the research, but we should keep all of this in mind because it's gonna be more complicated to maybe draw conclusions. So one of the first things we started to do is we started to implement what they call a uh, susceptible infected model, which is a compartmental model. It's, uh, these models are typically used in all kinds of areas, it, uh, in epidemic research, but also in, uh, let's say, pharmaceutical industry where they uh, test medication. These models are also very useful in, uh, let's say, how the medication uh, goes through the uh, body. Um, but they're much more complicated models, of course. What this actually tells us is uh, there is a group of people that might be susceptible to being affected. And there is a kind of a rate going on, a rate that actually changes the susceptible to an infected. Uh, so the first one who is infected might infect others. And this system tells us how this would uh, go at an aggregated uh, population level. Um, there is a kind of a differential equation that would follow from this since the total of the susceptible and the infected should be uh, somehow constant. Um, based on this, you can actually derive a differential equation. And this was the differential equation that Verhulst derived when they started to investigate how populations in a country grow. And so the total size of a population, um, they, tried it to, they tried to predict this. And uh, Verhulst came up with this particular equation. Uh, so essentially, you can look at this equation as being a probability. ST divided by M can be seen as a probability. Uh, the a priori probability that a infected person would be in contact with a susceptible person. And then uh, the number of people that is infected is then multiplied with the number of infected people. And this also happens with a certain effect, uh, with a rate, because not every encounter might actually be leading to a um, an infection. Well, there is some mathematics behind this. Uh, we might be short on this maybe, but, uh, oh, I will go back um, one more. Um, so this uh, solution is essentially uh, um, a kind of a logistic curve that you can see here on the top. It contains three parameters. It contains a maximum value M that might be unknown. Uh, we might want to estimate that maximum number. There is a parameter beta, which is the slope, how fast are the number of infections increasing. And there is a parameter alpha here, which tells us a kind of a moment in time where, let's say, the number of infected people is halfway its maximum, typically called the turning point. If you solve this equation, there is a kind of an implicit relationship between alpha, beta, and m. And this is actually... Uh, the equation for that. So alpha can essentially be formed from the two parameters beta and m. And then it would satisfy perfectly this compartmental model. Well, if you analyze this model, you can do this in different ways. One of the things that you can do is we can actually start um, doing a kind of nonlinear normal regression analysis, where this is the uh, expected equation, the curve um, for the number of infected people. And this number is uh, constantly increasing eh, because over time it gets higher and higher in this particular SI model. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't change it, it cannot go down. Uh, there are of course other models, we'll talk about them, where this number also goes down in a certain moment. But for this model it does not, it just keeps increasing. So this is a kind of an S-curve um, and there is some noise around this and this noise uh, can be assumed normal. And then in this particular way, we can actually estimate the parameters M, beta, and alpha separately. Although there might be a restriction between these parameters in this analysis, I do not put in um, any of these restrictions. You can extend this analysis by also including some heterogeneity into the error because variability may change um, at different time points. And there might be certainly correlation available between the different time points eh, because we're using infected number of people at different days. So the next day will be depending on the previous day. So some kind of autoregressive structure might be needed. If you analyze the 30 uh, provinces with which we started with this particular model, uh, then we can actually show that there is some kind of variability in the alphas, the turning points, which is uh, uh, in this case uh, days. Um, and there is some variability in the growth of the, of the 
infections, which changes from point 15 to point 38. And the maximum actually changed from 18 people to 67,000 people. And this last, this high number is coming from this particular province, Hubei, where everything started. One of the things was very nice. If you look at these uh, provinces, um, the curve fitted very well. So 99%, uh, the R square is about 99%. So it does fit quite good to the Chinese data in each of the provinces. Okay, so this is an example here on the right hand side. This is the aggregated data for whole China. Uh, there is something going on here in the middle apparently with the collection of data, which is of course a concern also in some of the other countries. Data is not always properly collected, so, but still this particular curve seems to fit the data quite reasonably. We investigated in our analysis whether or not this restriction between alpha and this beta and M, whether or not that restriction was actually satisfied for these 30 provinces. And based on the correlation that we calculated, we actually demonstrated that this relationship that should come from this uh, differential equation was actually not satisfied or doesn't seem to have a strong relationship. So apparently when we fit the data, these S curves, what we see is that this uh, relationship between alpha and the beta and M is not very strong, while the differential equation says it should be. So this tells us probably that the SI model is not the right one, even though the curve seems to fit quite well to the, through the points. So let's talk about estimation and prediction. Um, so what we tried to do is we started to simulate some data. Now we are simulating a more complicated model. We are now simulating what they call the SIR model, which is also a compartmental model. But now actually I can come uh, being susceptible. I can become infected. And at a certain moment, I am removed from the equation either because I am recovered or because I might actually have died. And so now the IT um, is maybe increasing in the beginning and then at a certain moment it actually drops again because everybody recovers and there are not a lot of new infections coming in. So now the IT might not be an accumulated number. Um, so we simulated this model. There are two rates now, the rate of uh, from being susceptible to infected and from infected to recovered, these two rates. And these two rates typically determine the reproduction number that is often mentioned on television. Um, the ratio between them um, is a kind of a reproduction number of how well the virus spreads. If you start predicting, uh, if you're using this Verhulst curve, uh, this, uh, this S curve, and you start predicting the maximum value M, which we know exactly uh, to be better, we know the value in simulations, then this is a the bias curve that you actually get. So as you can see, we are underestimating the M when we are actually at the beginning of the curve. So it's very difficult to estimate the maximum value um, if this would be the underlying system and we are using the Verhulst model, and which is a well-known issue uh, with the Verhulst model. So what you can do is uh, if you would know something about this bias correction, you can actually correct for it. Right? So you can, um, at every time point, you can uh, say, okay, now I know I'm underestimating. You can use a kind of a calibration model to correct for this underestimation. And then based on our simulations, we demonstrated that we can actually estimate the M quite well when we are at about 40% of the curve. Uh, so when we have the 40, first 40% 40 of the whole curve, then we are able to give proper estimates of M. The bias is very small. However, how do you get this calibration curve? Well, you can use it for simulation. Uh, but one of the things we did is we actually used the provinces from China to create a calibration curve. And as you can see here, if you take a kind of an average curve through this, you can see that in the beginning, uh, after about 12 or 13 days, we're underestimating uh, because the data in China, we more, more or less had the whole curve uh, available. So we could see what happened um, with the calibration. And we use this calibration in our prediction. Well, this gives you an overview of how well we did. This is uh, short-term predictions, uh, so the first uh, few days that we uh, predict ahead. Um, and this is relative, uh, so we have a prediction and then the, the next day we can collect what the real number were. So we can compare the predicted value with the um, observed value. And then this is a kind of a, a picture of how well we did. It's not always perfect. Uh, sometimes we are outside 10% of the, of the observed number. 
And here is a list of uh, countries that we used, and here is an overview of how often we are within 5% of the true number, within 5 and 10, and more than 10%. And this is for uh, this left side is for infections. And here on the right side, the death is even more complicated um, to use the Verhulst model. Um, and so it's not perfect, um, but still, and this and these predictions that we used here. Um, uh, we actually were used for uh, hospitalization, for to actually help hospitals calculate their capacity um, using the uh, predictions we made on the number of infections. I might say something here. One of the other things we actually tried to do is we are trying to find out at what moment are we turning um, using this Verhulst model. And here you can see a few interesting pictures. So one of the things we actually looked into, we have a kind of an infected number at a certain day. We estimate the uh, maximum based on this uh, data up to that day, and we can uh, calculate this ratio. And if this ratio is uh, more than 50%, then this gives us an indication that we might actually be turning because then we are actually uh, more than 50% away from um, the total curve. And this is a picture of, uh, if you would do this from March 14 up to April 1, you actually see for the Netherlands that around March 30, 31, we are actually going over the 50%. And it demonstrates that from that moment, we seem to have turned to uh, the, the right, uh, uh, essentially that the number of infections would slowly go down and we would flatten the curve at a certain moment. Of course, we also looked at the turning point itself um, and this subtracted the day at which we were doing the analysis. And of course, when this uh, difference would get bigger than zero, this is also an indication that we are over the turning point. So we use these two statistics to do this. We used other data to verify whether or not this seems a reasonable approach. And as you can see, this was Italy at the bottom. Um, and so from the moment that uh, this uh, significantly deviated from the 50%, these uh, statistics, it started to increase and it started to flatten more. So we actually reported on March 31 that Netherlands was actually doing um, changing uh, the situation from increase to decrease. However, um, when we start looking into the flattening, it looked also that uh, the European countries were not really uh, flattening like the Chinese countries. So at a certain moment, our predictions were a little bit off, started to get worse. So we started to include a more general model, which is the generalized logistic curves. Essentially, this is the differential equation that we talked about. So there's this beta, the infections, max set to the power of gamma. So this was first one. Now I'm introducing a parameter. We're looking at the infections divided by the maximum. That maximum needs to be estimated to the power delta and to the power eta as this, uh, to, um, this difference. Um, and so this is a much big general generalization of the curve. We didn't implement all these parameters at all times uh, because it's not easy to estimate this uh, particular in this setting where M needs to be estimated, delta needs to be estimated, and eta needs to be estimated. So we made some choices there, but we could actually calculate this or estimate this very easily using a kind of a Poisson regression where we looked at the new infections for the daily new infections conditionally on the total number of infections at a certain moment. And that is a kind of a Poisson regression that we did and we could estimate beta, gamma, uh, M, and eta. And here you can see uh, the provinces in the Netherlands where we implemented this method. And actually you can see that it follows quite nicely the curve and the predictions are uh, quite well uh, as well. And this is actually uh, showing some of the parameter estimates that we actually implemented for some countries. There's a big difference in the rates. Interesting one here is maybe the USA. Uh, which is a very high number. The USA is not doing very well. Um, but we also see here in these overview tables that our predictions are much better within 5% than the earlier curves that we used. Well, this is a st status quo. This is June 9. These are the, all the, not, it's not curves, eh? this is just the data. These are the number of infections. Interesting things are, of course, that the, uh, the USA is still increasing. Chile is actually still very going very rapidly up. Sweden is not really bending yet. It's not uh, flattening yet. It was a huge discussion on the television, uh, I think, two days ago that Sweden did such a good job. Well, you could argue about that. 
um, if you look at these curves and look at uh, certain numbers. And these were the number of deaths. Um, and also here you see Sweden relative to the population size and some other countries. Uh, Belgium is, uh, um, is also not very well. You should be careful, of course, when you look at this data because of the different ways that people test and the different deaths that people include. So it's not that easy to, to compare all of these curves, but it gives an insight. Then maybe the last topic, I'm not sure how much time I have, but I'll try to be quick. One of the things we also did is we tried to find out what the um, influence of the um, governments were on the growth uh, rate, uh, or the, so the beta that we talked about the whole time. We are actually used a very extensive compartmental model where there is a susceptible, and then if you get the virus, you might not infect everybody yet. So there is a kind of an exposed period where you are not contagious. And then after a certain period, you actually got infected and you become infectious. Um, and of course, not everybody is tested. So we actually split uh, the curve, uh, the split this compartmental model in two pieces where we have tested infected people. And there are, of course, infected people that are not tested. And we took this into account in our model, although we don't have this data. The infected can be separated in hospitalized and removed again, either by death or recovery. This is a complicated model. Uh, I will skip a little bit of the details how we implemented this, but essentially we did an iterative Poisson regression analysis where we started to estimate the parameters beta, the parameter rho, uh, and we had to implement a few assumptions about the delays of uh, how quickly people are recovering. And we also implemented some, uh, let's say, some um, research that was done by the RIVM about this delay process, this, uh, this, uh, this incubation time in the exposed one. These were all included in our analysis. And we actually started to create a um, profile. So this is our, our model, how it fits with the data. So the solid line is actually telling us uh, how well it goes through the uh, number of new infections at every day. This is the Netherlands, uh, Italy, and Spain. And uh, what we created, we created a profile, and this is the profile for the Netherlands. So we are essentially saying, can the data tell us when this particular beta is changing? And as you can see here in the picture, eh, so it is uh, from March 8 or so, 7, it is uh, relatively stable. And then at March 17, the data suggests that we should go down with a different rate beta. And then there is another period, it keeps constant. And then it is going down at March 24. So we made this profile for different countries. And then we said, OK, at what moment were these governments actually implemented, implementing um, uh, measures? Yeah, and here there are a few measures. We have lockdown measures, which is the triangle, I think. We have closing schools and restaurants. And we have banning events. And by looking at this data, if these, uh, our model was implemented in such a way that when this particular measure would fall um, exactly on the moment of change, or one or day, one or two days, uh, or one day earlier or later, we actually think that that might be um, the, let's say, the implementation of this measure. And that's what we, our model tries to do. So if there would be any delay from measures, that is already incorporated in our model. These are uh, the profiles of Italy and Spain. So it's not always perfect, as you can see. And based on all of these countries, we try to extract what measures did work and what measures did not work. And this is an overview of, uh, let's say, big changes in the profile and what uh, measures were actually taken when this change in the profile happened. So this is a kind of an overview of all of these measures. And one of the things that you actually see is a lot of these measures were taken together. But closure of schools and banning events seems to be always related to a big change. Um, and full lockdown is sometimes related to a big change, but sometimes not. Sometimes we need enforcement by the police to actually make this, uh, let's say, this rate or this uh, change in profile go down. And uh, we also think that uh, closing of restaurants did not do uh, a lot, um, well, considering the measures that might already have been taken. And so we actually say that it looks like a kind of a direct effect of uh, banning uh, events at schools. Um, and the lockdown that has a delayed effect, in particular when there would be um, police enforcement um, to help um, that people satisfy the lockdown. And again, the restaurants, I don't think did a lot to this when all of the other measures were implemented. 
Maybe this is interesting because here we have uh, some of the parameters that we estimated. We have a parameter rho for the tests. So this is the ratio S. So for instance, in the Netherlands, we think that 20% of the people in the Netherlands, of the infected people have been tested based on our data. Uh, in Sweden, that is only about 3%. And in Italy, it's a little bit higher. And I think this is uh, considering the news that we have from these countries, this seems to be um, in line with uh, the testing policies. Um, and we also see that at the end, after all measures have been implemented, uh, all contact rates, uh, all these beta, these growth rates are very close to each other. Uh, seems to be three groups, Germany, Spain, and Italy with around 0.26. And it's Belgium, the Netherlands, and the UK at around 0.35. And Sweden seems to be still a little bit off, a little bit higher, and has less uh, effect from all the measures that they take. So that will finalize my talk. I was very quick, I think. Um, one of the things that is very complicated, eh, so we should be careful with all of these analysis and all these conclusions because uh, the data isn't collected in a certain way. And I think what we should do to actually get real information out of this data, that we should look at this data in many different um, directions, use many different models, different approaches to actually capture the information that is present. Um, and then used all of that together to make a kind of a statement about what we think is going on. And I would like to call that the kind of a data oriented approach or the data science approach, where we step away from traditional approaches from statistics and look at this much more from a data science approach than uh, we are used to. And that would finalize my presentation. Thank you very much, um, Edwin, for the very clear and nice uh, presentation. I would like to ask people that have questions to enter them in the Q&A. I'm now seeing them. I've also myself uh, probably two questions uh, before some more questions pop up in the Q&A. Go ahead. <laughs> One question is still, uh, how is it with the younger children? Could you isolate from your model that? Because I saw some combinations of events and uh, could you say something uh, so, about that? So one of, the, some, one of the issues that we have and uh, one of the things we would like to do is we'd like to compare some of the analysis that we do, whether or not it is consistent across countries. And one of the things is very difficult to get is the individual data. So it's very difficult to know the number of infections um, in different age groups. I know they exist. Eh? I know that the REVM um, has this data available, but we don't have this data available at every day uh, uh, for every country. Uh, we would love to look at that um, to see uh, whether or not this rate is really different for the different subgroups. Uh, there is reports about this, eh? REVM reports this, um, and it would be nice to see how our models would behave on these different uh, subgroups. Um, I'm still uh, trying to get some additional data from different uh, people that have data or different institutes that have data. But uh, that is always a very slow process. Yeah. And probably one other question. What, what do you think? Uh, what, what is your evaluation of what, what are you going, going, uh, what are you going to do looking forward with this model? Yeah, so, one of the things, so one of the things we are now creating, we, yeah, it's related to, uh, I think, the dashboard that we're going to hear about. We're also trying to come up with a few number of uh, statistics, the ones that we are already using in these analysis. And one of the things we are currently doing is uh, in this very complicated uh, compartmental model, we are looking at this rate and to see whether or not now it's increasing again. And our, uh, this is preliminary. Uh, it looks like the Netherlands is slightly going up again. Um, when we use our model, but we are not completely sure at this moment whether this is just because we have allowed more tests. Yeah. Um, so there is a kind of an issue whether this is really the spread of the virus or whether this is just a policy change again of the government. Yeah. Um, and that is always the complication of separating these effects. Okay, probably uh, Julia and Jane, you could pick out a few questions, probably two more from the Q and A's that we received, uh, and then uh we will end this part of the presentation thanks could you do so julia and jay or interesting question from emma um did you also calculate confidence intervals for your estimates how yes. did you obtain them yeah so in the profiles i didn't mention that so the profiles are demonstrated where we had these solid lines of the beta 
um, the boxes around this were actually the confidence intervals. Um, and so when I, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, constant, uh, uh, where this constant rate um, changes from uh, a different time point, the, the, we saw these boxes and these boxes were confidence intervals. And also, of course, when we fit uh, um, the, the Furholz curves, we always use confidence intervals. We can see them from the, I think we saw them also in this picture where we use confidence intervals. Yeah, there is a problem there eh, because the data isn't collected um, in a way that we want. So although you use sim, eh, you use the techniques that are out there that are very common in, uh, in good sampling uh, strategies, and we also see that sometimes if you have this selected data, that these confidence intervals somewhat underestimate sometimes uh, the, the variability in the estimates. Yeah, I saw also a very interesting question by Rudy. Uh, he's asking about um, the influences of testing. Is th yeah. In fact, the question is testing very useful. Uh, also, of course, depending on what you do with these tests. Yeah, I actually have a very strong opinion about this. Um, what I would love to have when this type of uh, pandemics happen is that they come up with a testing policy and they keep it constant. Um, because the constant change in testing policy uh, makes it very difficult to uh, correct for uh, in some of these analysis. And sometimes you see a, a kind of an increase which is actually coming from the testing policy. So it, so it is already very difficult to get an estimate of the effects and to see uh, which one is affecting what, because a lot of the measures are taken together. And this is essentially even made worse by the change in policies. And I think the Netherlands is a, a country that has changed their policy quite a bit. Um, and that doesn't make it easy. Uh, but that's why we also look at different countries to see whether we see consistency in some of these things that we have evaluated. And so that is a kind of a way of, to overcome these uh, testing policies, but it isn't perfect. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, for the sake of time, we have to move to our uh, next speaker, Bert Slachter. Um, Bert, uh, I probably don't have to introduce him anymore because there were weeks that he was every night on TV. Um, <laughs> he, will now, he will now talk about um, um, one of his, uh, about the IC capacity model about uh, constructing reliable exit plans but i think uh, most interesting a little bit about the dashboard what type of dashboard do you need what type of data should be on that dashboard and how would you monitor that threshold value things like that uh, better we talk about that my latest information is that it will be a kind of special presentation because you are there Bert, with your phone and uh, Jane and Julia have the slides and uh, proceed with the slides. That is due to some technical yeah. issues. Uh, hopefully it will work out, but uh, let's start. Thank you. Yeah, let's try. Um, uh, we'll find out if it works. I hope you guys can see me um, because the presentation is done by uh, someone else. Um, but my background is in complex systems, in complexity and in uncertainty. So I didn't come from uh, the data science perspective, but from a slightly different angle. And my personal favorite topic um, in that is decision making and acting under uncertainty. And we'll come, come back to that later. Um, a side gig um, or, or a hobby, so you will. I've been writing and speaking about uh, financial technology um, a lot the last years. Um, and from that field, uh, I saw something going wrong uh, in January when Wuhan entered lockdown. Me and my brother Peter, we worked together on complexity. We realized that the lockdown of China and, and possibly a lot of other countries um, uh, would have a huge impact on, on the world economy and, 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 and trade. The, the world has never been as connected as it was in, in January. So we monitored this um, uh, epidemic closely. Um, it seemed like a deadly disease, dangerous for young people as well. Um, although we had reasons to believe that the data from China um, was unreporting. The, 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 the numbers were too low, but we didn't know. Actually, nobody knew at that point. And that's the main theme. 
we know very little. We know next to nothing. There's so much uncertainty and conflicting evidence about the virus, about the way it spreads, about the disease, about the damages, damage it does to people's body, and about the data. So I decided to call upon the Dutch government on February 24. On the next slide, you see um, uh, an, um, if it worked, yeah, it's an article I wrote, and, and I said, we need to act now, we need to reduce connectivity. That's the term that complexity scientists use for the connective, the connected network of people. Because the spread of the virus is not only a function of the virus itself, but maybe more importantly, um, a function of the network in which it spreads, the network of people. So reduce um, connectivity. And most important thing to do is uh, stop international flights or uh, long-range connectivity, but also um, uh, stop with large events and gatherings. Well, by now we know that that didn't happen, not until three weeks later. On March 16, uh, Mark Rutte introduced the Dutch strategy um, of flatten the curve, um, a strategy that primarily focused on The, the healthcare system. It, 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 um, the next slide shows the famous um, uh, addressing the nation of Mark Rutte. Um, yeah, that's the one. Uh, the first time since, um, well, what was it? Uh, a war, probably. Long time ago. Well, about that healthcare system, the most scarce, the scarcest resource in healthcare is the capacity of the care unit. But the capacity is um, 30 to 100 times bigger than ICU capacity. So that's the constraint, intensive care units. That's the bottleneck. So that brings us to the, 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 the first phase, let's say the first phase for me in this epidemic. That's the next slide. Um, the ICU capacity. We did not have our smart lockdown at that point, point. and many people didn't um, believe that a lockdown was necessary at all. So we built a very simple model to forecast the required ICU capacity based on that current situation. I think it was March 16 or March 17. We did not use compartmental models, like we saw um, from Edwin. Um, there, there were too many unknowns at that point. So we just tried to extrapolate the, the, the data series that were available. Um, and we used a very simple process. On the next slide, I uh, wrote it down. It's the process of um, where, where people go, through when they get infected, they get symptomatic, they go to the hospital, intensive care, and they die, or they recover, of course. But uh, um, what are between infected, between symptomatic and, and hospitalized? And what what are the the the, the period uh, the intervals? So we we started to read a lot of. Uh, research about it. It's on the next slide, I made a screenshot of the, the spreadsheet we made with all the academic papers that we um, uh, read and the, the, um, the data that, that they, well, what that was in their conclusions. And there was a lot of variation, um, huge difference, differences. Um, from outs unreliable. Um, so, what we actually did is we fitted the data we already had, um, and we, we we searched values that fitted the the curve that we already saw, and we used the values in the academic papers to verify if it was within the the, the, the bandwidth that they found. Um, 
in the, on the next slide, you see the, you see the variables that we, we used at that point. Uh, incubation period, yeah, let's take six. The, the literature said something between four and 14 days. The median values differed a lot. So we took that and, and, and we, we got to um, the, um, on the next slide, you see the prediction that we made at that point, that if we wouldn't have lockdown, then we would get um, a lot of people in the intensive care. On the next slide, please. If we can see it, yeah. Yes, so we made a dashboard for it. And you can see that without the lockdown, at that point, um, it, the, the number of intensive care admissions would peak on more than 20,000 on a single day. Uh, um, that's our model to show that a lockdown was absolutely necessary. And that going for herd immunity would take years. And we use the model to show that there's a lag between interventions and the results. Um, so we mainly use this model to show on the next slide, please, you see um, the process that people go. Yeah, yes, this one again. And we, we mainly used it to show to people how it works. Um, what exponential growth is that, that, that the number of infections double and they do not, um, there's not, not, it's not addition and subtraction, but it's doubling and halving. Um, we used it to, um, to inform the public, to educate, to help people understand how a virus spread, how an epidemic works. And um, in that process, we learned a few things that helped us in the next phase. The next phase, on the next slide, you see the next phase. That's, of course, the exit plan. Because at that point, oh, okay, th oh, this, this one's nice as well, yeah. So um, we overestimated um, the number of ICU um, uh, beds that were needed. We, 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 we estimated that around 1,400 to 2,000 beds would be needed. And, it's peaked on 1300, so, but it's nice. Okay, and on the next slide, you see the exit plan. And um, we, we knew at that point that the government institutions were steering through the rearview mirror um, by two or three weeks. They, they also didn't know what was happening. They also made their decisions based on hospital admissions. So they're lagging by two weeks. We didn't have tests um, uh, when someone could be tested was changed three times. The definition of when uh, someone can go into intensive care changed because of triage. So we didn't have reliable data. We didn't have um, the, the, the test trace isolate in place. But a few weeks later, around mid-April, people started talking about reopening the economy. We need to start uh, to restart the economy. We need to open up, but it's way too early. There were many infections at that point, and we were only two doublings away from the ICU crisis again. Um, we, we didn't actually know what, what, what the effect was of the policy changes that we, we took. So that's why we, we wrote a comprehensive piece for um, follow the money um, about an exit plan. On the next slide, you see a screenshot of it. And our, our perspective was that of complexity and uncertainty. That half and uh, halfway April, there was still so much unknown. And unknown about the virus, unknown about uh, so he said, we're driving in a fog. And uh, Mark Rutte, he said, we're making 100% of the decisions. Not, and th that are indications that there's opacity, that there's not a clear vision. Um, so 
how to make decisions under uncertainty. What to do when evidence is incomplete, what to do when the data is not good enough to make decisions. And the Dutch approach um, is to mistake the absence of evidence with evidence of absence. And that means um, in the beginning there was no evidence that this virus spreads medic patients. We didn't know. There was conflicting evidence. And so the government made the assumption that it doesn't spread. And that's a very risky assumption. The same goes for masks. Do masks work? We don't know. There's conflicting evidence. So the, our government made the assumption that they don't work. But when in uncertainty, you need to make sure that you do not cause a catastrophe. The first thing you need to do, if you want to take risk, you have to prove that no harm is done. And that was the problem at that point in time. It was impossible to um, prove that opening up the economy wouldn't do any harm because we didn't know anything. There were thousands, maybe 10,000 daily infections at that point still. And in theory, their theory was very simple. We just have to keep the R, the, the reproduction number at one and then, or below one. But the point is with that high number of infections, it's very, very hard to keep the, the R con constant. It would require a balancing act um, of increasing and decreasing measures, but we don't know anything. And our conclusion was the only way you can open up, you can do an exit, it, then you have to first decrease the daily number of infections to very low numbers. Not thousands but tens or hundreds and you can on the next a few measures that we proposed um, that, that that support our conclusion um, on the next slide please okay then we can see them and part of these measures uh, yeah so we, 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 we thought we had to go to very low numbers, and that's the first one, control. You, you first need to reduce, and then you can relax. And the, the, the three below, the test, trace, and isolate, uh, we weren't able to do that at a point in time because we had too many infections. So that also plans for more reduction. Pro protect, we couldn't protect the people in, the, the, in, the, in healthcare, in the in the schools and we didn't have uh, very good data so and no complete data streams um, fortunately we weren't the only ones that reached this conclusion also the, the world health organization and a lot of um, uh, other uh, research um, also reached this conclusion that we need to have this. Next slide, please. At this point in time, we are, we have arrived at that point that we have reduced the number of new infections to hundreds per day, and it's still decreasing. Or it was decreasing up until last week. We don't know at this moment. And only a very few of the measures have been lifted. Most important spread factors um, are still blocked, like the large gatherings, um, crowded indoor gatherings, international travel. And we might also benefit from the summer season. People are outdoors, humidity and sunlight might help, we don't know, but might. And so this is the time to create a system that helps us respond to a second wave or more in general, to identify new clusters of infections. And that's where the Corona dashboard uh, comes in. On the next slide, you see a screenshot of the dashboard that has been launched, I think, about a week ago. Um, this is online, it's live now, and but it, it, 
it is data that we already had. It con contains the positive tests, the hospital admissions, and the ICU admissions. The same old data, the same bad data, with a nice new front end. So before we can say that this dashboard can really support um, and can really help in preventing uh, new um, infections, new um, uh, rise in infections, a second wave, so you will, we need more and we need better data. We need more reliable data. Um, for example, the, the tests, um, we didn't test everyone and we do now, or, well, there has been some reports that, for example, children are still not tested, they are sent away. So it's, we're on our way to a situation that we test everyone. Um, so, but then we have a discontinuity in the, in the data series because we didn't test everyone and now we test everyone. So the data needs to become reliable. Same goes for hospital admissions. Um, there's a huge lag in data, the, um, uh, hospital admissions from the 10 hospital admissions from today, five of them are from weeks ago. So we need reliable data series, but we also need new or other data series. For example, um, the, the wastewater analysis, it's very promising. That's, um, um, that could act as a leading indicator. On the next slide, I'm, I put a, a, a graph from um, an, a research paper from the United States. The, the red line is um, the, the, the viral RNA that was measured in the wastewater and the, the um, black line are the positive tests. So it's a leading indicator for about three days on, um, on tests. And that's great because um, we can see that something is happening Instant reaches is local um, before people actually um, get sick and get tested and get a test results. So wastewater, mobility data, contact tracing data, surveys, those data series can act as a leading generator. And they are very reliable data streams because they're not dependent on human action. So that's one part that we need. We need more data and we need re more reliable data and, and especially data that is earlier in the process. That's, um, automatic and more regional. So at this moment, the dashboard doesn't do anything. If it uh, goes above a threshold, um, nothing changes. The, the, the government still needs to make decisions. And what we would actually want is that if infections rise above a certain threshold level in a certain region, that automatically certain uh, measures uh, are taken, that a new set of measures comes into uh, effect, um, that measures are scaled up and scaled down automatically, flexible. And the leading indicators could, could give a prepare signal. So, if a leading indicator goes above the threshold, you could send a prepare signal to a region, prepare for measures. And if the, uh, the, 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 the next, I put um, a screenshot from their website. Um, they use a, an, an alert system with four levels, um, uh, level with the most restrictions, and uh, one is the level with, well, you only have to be prepared that something might happen. There are now, uh, well, this was on Monday, 27th of April, an old screenshot. So I think um, that they're currently in the lower level. That doesn't matter. The next screenshot, the next slide, you see two interesting remarks. One is different parts of the country may be at different alert levels. So they make a distinction between regions. And the second remark is we can also move up and down alert levels. So there's some kind of uh, adaptive system where regions 
independent of each other on what happens. And I, I, I talk to the team that's built to go and they have the same vision. They want to build this, but it's up to the government to decide to provide the data. They don't have the data, they only build the dashboard. It's up to the government to, to define the policy used to scale up and down. It's up to the government to inform and engage the public with the system. So, to conclude, an exit strategy requires very low numbers of infections and reliable data about them. And an exit strategy also requires keeping those numbers low. And in order to do that, we need more data series to be able to forecast both the number of infections and the place of the infections. So that will be my conclusion. So that's it. Thank you. Very, very good, uh, Bert. Very interesting, uh, especially the last part. Very interesting about uh, dashboards. Julia and Jane, did we get um, many Q and A's? At, at some point, I, I, I made also a remark in the Q and A, also on the chat, that at some point it was a little bit difficult to understand. But we are recording this, and probably we can make some additions to the recordings at those places where it was very bad. Um, we will look into that and also make the materials available, the slides that uh, that Bert uh, showed. But uh, Julia and Jane, do you think that uh, there were Q and A's that we could uh, forward to Bert? There is one interesting question from uh, Jan Taco de Um Bert, did you got a reaction of the government on your paper on February 24th? And what was this re reaction if you got one? Yeah, we, we, um, on February 24th, okay. First one, I didn't, um, audience said that uh, follow the money on our piece there. So that was actually the start of, 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 of our involvement um, with policy makers and, um, journalists so. we, we I, I didn't get whether you got a reaction because it was the the uh, uh, sound was very uh, bad what, what what could you repeat it once what you said Bert? i didn't get a re reaction on the the piece of february 24th we didn't have the audience at that moment but we did get a lot of reactions on the follow the money Okay, yeah, that is more, that's better. Still not fantastic, but I now understand it. Um, and from policy makers and probably the next question. Uh, Jane and Julia. Um, I have an interesting question here from Patrick. Um, what is the sensitivity of the sewage data? Could it uh, detect 10 cases in a region as big as Amsterdam? That's a good question. Um, I don't know, actually, I don't know. I know that the Netherlands was one of the first countries to work on this. So, um, there is a there, there there is a lot of knowledge about this in the Netherlands, but I don't know it. I don't know it. The answer. Julia. Um, I think Peter uh, Pilot Pilot uh, has another question regarding uncertainty. Measures like social dis distancing, it is clear it works or it does not. But regarding masks, wrong use works negative. So how do you deal with this? Um, 
the question is if that is true if wrong use really works negative it, it it's that's true for healthcare workers because they need 100 percent protection and it's it's only okay if they're 100 percent protected but for non-medical use anything better than nothing is good so we don't need 100 percent protection that's one of the the misconceptions also in the communication from the government they said um, masks don't work because you're not 100 percent protected you cannot be certain that you are protected but that's not the point of masks the point is that you reduce even if you would re reduce the chance of infection by only 30 percent that's huge yeah I, I i also want to ask something probably calculating these threshold values is not too difficult i mean the reproduction factor is probably uh, rather straightforward and the additional capacity at the uh, uh, at the intensive care is probably also not too difficult to calculate but the relation to which measures to take and there edwin's story also comes into play probably that, that is probably a very difficult one and and how local or global must that be have yeah. you thoughts about that and probably edwin also yeah well i i have i have one thought about it and that is that a lockdown is a very very expensive Expensive measure. So, the best thing to do is to find measures that that um, that cost a little, but that do a lot. And most of that kind of measures are hard to implement, so they're not not well suited for um, the the crisis phase. So it's 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 normal that that the countries use lockdowns. It's the only thing you can implement in a day but now we have more time so now we can do more sophisticated measures that cost less and have bigger upside so that will be my uh, perspective and what what type of measures are those have you thoughts about that or is that still under yeah you're thinking about that well for for example um things yeah well we we, we need a lot of research what those measures should be because we know from the spread that there's a lot of um skew in the um how how, how it is um how these infections are uh, distributed an r of three doesn't mean that everyone um, infects exactly three other uh, persons 80 percent of the people probably doesn't infect anyone infects zero persons and a few people infect a lot of, of, of other persons. So we need to find out what those conditions are under which super spreading um, happens. And it could be uh, ventilation, or it could be um, uh, disabling certain kinds of um, uh, infrastructure or gatherings, and, th and that needs research. Edwin, what do, what do you think about that? I mean, you did kind of simulations on the relation between the measures and the reproduction. If you look at this uh, dashboard, of course, there are threshold values and things like that, but the relation to which actions to take, what is your opinion about that? Uh, so I, I have been thinking about how uh, small should the areas be. Um, uh, so I think one of the advantages of looking at an aggregated level, certainly when uh, spread is continuing, eh, when it starts to in, uh, penetrate the country, I think an aggregated analysis is very quickly uh, shows what is going on, uh, because all of the mistakes or heterogeneities that might be uh, present at the local places is uh, essentially averaged out, let's say, eh? so mistakes in collection of data, um, uh, kind of uh, excesses type of numbers that is then at a higher level is uh, less effective. If you start going the other way around, you need to go to a more local setting, I think. Uh, but there also there is a complication in, uh, well, small numbers. Um, yeah, so um, there is a balance, I think, with how small the area should be or uh, what would be a proper unit, eh? because we looked at, for instance, at provinces, but provinces is uh, something that is nice for maybe government. 
um, but the virus doesn't care about provinces. Yeah, it's about uh, let's say how people move uh, around, and, and, and they might not stay. Yeah? People might travel from one province to the other. So uh, there is a kind of a balance I think you need to implement in um, um, local and I think aggregate. Um, yeah? So I don't think you should do one. Uh, I think you should actually look at a lot of these measures or some of these uh, tools that uh, Bert is actually proposing should be done locally and um, a national or province levels or so to see whether or not what is going on. And that indeed there is uh, some kind of research going on on big spreaders. Eh? These uh, people are more research is thinking that this uh, COVID is more determined by these big spread. Uh, people. And that's actually what you see eh? if you look at countries. You see a particular center and then everything is spread and partly because of the measures but i think also partly it's a it's a i think it's a maybe a characteristic of the virus and it could be due to these uh, people that are affecting a lot of people and those who are actually not affecting a lot of people and this heterogeneity should be done better i we should understand this better i agree with that fully there yeah now probably time for one last question mark yeah, so perhaps I can, so thanks a lot for, uh, for both of your talks, uh, great and very interesting. Um, so being a data scientist, uh, Bert, I have a question for you. So I, uh, I, of course, fully support the fact that we should work more data driven and have good quality data to work with. Um, but there are also a lot of other aspects that come into play when, when the government makes decisions, namely is the public supporting the decisions that are being made. And in fact, um, that also influences the effectiveness of the measures that eventually are, are taken, right? So if we are in this intelligent lockdown and, and everyone thinks, well, it's going fine with the disease, then if we continue the lockdown, probably the effectiveness of the lockdown will decrease because the public supports the measures less and therefore goes more often to the beach or whatever. Um, so uh, uh, do you see ways of taking this into account in models that you have? Or do you think we should work purely data driven and the rest is up to the government and the politics? Yeah, that's 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 exactly the reason that is that it is impossible to have five or ten thousand infections daily and maintain that for a longer period because people change behavior. So it's 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 a very good question. It's the most important question for policymakers at this point: how to maintain support because support is fading at this moment, and that's the reason we need to go back to very small numbers because you don't and have to run away and, and, and uh, cluster of infections. Uh, I think that one part um, of getting the people, the public engaged is to use the data and the representation of the data in the communication. So um, engage people with the dashboard and their regional part of the dashboard. And show them what those indicators mean and what will happen if we get above a threshold so that they know they are uh, they can influence whether there will be measures or not so that, that there's make them aware of the feedback loop between their behavior and the the numbers on the dashboard and at this moment the dashboard has been launched but there hasn't has not been any promotion yet not nothing whatsoever it has been um mentioned in the, the, the debate in the, uh, amongst politicians, but it hasn't been really been in the, in the media yet. I think they wait till we have more indicators and we have more data, but that could really engage the people and um, also help them um, maintaining support for over probably over a year because we we. Most most um, people think we will get a second wave. It could be a very very small wave if you do it right, or it can be a big second wave. But that there will be something happening in the next, let's say, winter season. Um, that's what most people believe. So we need to 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 maintain the support into September October, and that will be very hard. Thanks a lot. Very clear. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, we have come to the end. It's uh, almost uh, 15 minutes past uh, one. I would like to thank very much Bert and Edwin for very interesting presentations. 
Um, there will follow so a few more of these uh, uh, meetups. Uh, they will be advertised via uh, the website, via email. You're very much welcome to do this. Once again, thank you very much. And uh, I want to close now the session.